Welcome everybody to JASA's first webinar of 2023. We are excited because it is, we are celebrating our 50th year this year, and we are pleased and proud to dedicate today's presentation to the memory of Jacqueline Avant, who was a dedicated JASA member and a passionate collector of lacquer. When this presentation came up, we thought that it would be a wonderful idea to dedicate the talk to her memory. Jacqueline not only loved collecting lacquer for the artistic beauty of the pieces, but also because she often felt a spiritual connection to each object. And our presentation today will be a bit different from previous webinars in that after Anor Cervone has finished speaking about the five directions, lacquer through East Asia, Hollis Goodall, curator of Asian art at LACMA, will join us to give her recollections of Jacqueline Avant. We're especially pleased also today that some of Jacqueline's close friends and family have registered for this webinar and we are really pleased that you're with us and we are thinking of you. A few words about Enor Cervone, who is the Associate Curator of Asian Art at the Denver Art Museum. Enor has had a lot on her plate the last few months. Not only did she organize the exhibition, The Five Directions, Lacquer Through East Asia, which opened at LACMA in December, she organized another exhibition at her own museum called Her Brush, Japanese Women Artists from the Fong Johnston Collection. And that opened in November and runs through May. And she perhaps will tell us a little bit about it before Hollis comes on screen. But in any case, Anor, I'd like to welcome you. And I hope that it's not snowing too much in Denver, but we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I want to thank everyone at JASA um, and Alison Tolman in particular for the invitation to speak here today. It is a snowy blizzard here. It's beautiful outside for now until it's slushy. Um, so this talk is in the memory of Jacqueline Avon. She was a gentlewoman. She was a philanthropist, a collector, and she was funny and warm and a lover of art. I first met her thanks to Hollis Godal, curator of Japanese art at LACMA, um, while I was still a fellow there. Um, and Hollis will share her thoughts about Jackie uh, today as well. So Jacqueline invited us to her home. Um, she spread dozens and dozens of Japanese lacquers, each with a story, each with a story she knew so well and shared so generously with us. I think some people leave an immediate impression on you, even in the briefest of encounters, and Jackie was certainly one of them. So this talk is dedicated to Jackie on the subject that was very dear to her heart, East Asian lacquer. We will rethink today narratives of lacquer's development throughout East Asia as they are explored in the exhibition, The Five Directions, which is currently on view until April 16, 2023 at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. But maybe we can start at the beginning. What exactly do I mean by the five directions? There are some universal certainties that anchor us, that orient us, the way we think of our relationship to the world around us, how we conceive of our place in space in relation to the geography within which we exist. But can we recognize it not as a universal truth, but instead as a phenomenological construct, a subjective interpretation of space? The five directions was the dominant spatial and cosmological conception of the universe in various cultures throughout Asia. So the directions of north, south, east, and west are joined by a fifth, the center. This concept is called Oban in Korean, Godai in Japanese, 
Panchabuta in Sanskrit, Wufang in Chinese, and so forth. What does it mean for the center to be a direction? The definition of a direction is a course along which someone or some thing moves. How does one move to the center, inwards? Now bear this question in mind when you think back on lacquer exhibitions you visited in the past. Art historical discourse on lacquer's development in East Asia tends to be somewhat reductionist. What often comes to mind is a unilateral process of development of lacquer as um, originating in China in the central kingdom and then radiating outwards, impacting different polities and regions surrounding it. When in reality, the objects tell us quite a different story, a complex one. They tell us a story of multidirectional development, of mutual influences, of cross-pollination, of adaptation, of innovation. In short, they tell us a story that is anything but linear. And so this is how the spatial concept of the five directions informs the exhibition, in that we look at this web at the meeting points while at the same time, we also take each lacquer producing center as a center in its own right. And I think this dual approach is captured quite nicely in two maps that are on view. The first is a map of China, a map of the great Ming dynasty. But, and here's the kicker, it was made 37 years after the fall of the Ming dynasty. And to complicate matters, it was produced in Japan. While this Japanese map focuses on China, it is not self-effacing. On the contrary, I would argue that this map renders China as part of Japan rather than the other way around. Notice how the waterways and rivers are supersized. They break the continental terrain into these islands and islands as if a natural continuation of Japan's archipelago. And then there are these bright vermilion lines stretching from Japan to China and from China to the Ryukyu Kingdom. These mark the maritime trade routes during the Ming Dynasty. And so this map is all about connectivity. Like the exhibition, it focuses on those meeting points. Now the format of the map is not native to Japan. It is intended to be viewed frontally with north, south, east, and west marked on the top, bottom, right, and left respectively. Now, traditionally maps in Japan were made to be viewed in the round, like this one, gracing a large Arita um, blue and white charger. Now here, Japan appears at the very center. It's fringed with countries, both real and imagined, from Korea and the UQ kingdom to the country governed by women and Lilliput, or the country of small people. And so these two maps capture two the two approaches of the exhibition, examining the multidirectional flow of ideas, materials, and techniques of lacquer art, while also turning inwards, turning to the center, acknowledging and celebrating regional singularities, giving equal weight to Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and Ryukyuan lacquer. Now, what exactly is lacquer? It is the distilled sap of a species of trees. Most widely known of them is Toxicodendrum vernicifluum, widely known as the lacquer tree. Lacquer is a natural polymer. So when it's exposed to oxygen, 
moisture around 85 percent humidity ideally and just within the right temperature range hovering around 70 degrees fahrenheit it hardens and it becomes remarkably stable now, this is what lacquer looks like prior to curing. It is um, a viscous liquid. Here, it is darkened with oxidation. It's usually um, milky when it is extracted from the tree. And what we see in this image here is a traditional technique in Japan of filtering raw lacquer through um, mulberry paper by stretching it between two wooden clasps or dowels and then twisting them very slowly. Now, once Lacquer is applied and treated and cured. It is incredibly lightweight. It's impervious to water. It's temperature insulating. It's acid resistant. It's remarkable. And another nifty thing about it is that it can be applied to almost any surface. Lacquer can be applied to ceramics, as we see here in this Domon jar from the Royal Ontario Museum. Lacquer can be applied to leather, like this gentleman's belt from the Han Dynasty in the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities in Stockholm. Lacquer can be applied to fabric, um, as Tanaka Nobuyuki does beautifully in his contemporary work. It can be applied to metals, like we see here in a Song Dynasty bronze mirror with uh, figures of a scholar in attendance. Lacquer can be applied as a pigment on paper and silk. It can be applied to wood. It can be even applied to wicker. It can be layered and layered and built up and then deeply carved, revealing all of the different layers. And it can even be applied to the human body. You name it. So this versatility, durability, and beauty of this material made it into a popular commodity. Lacquer circulated between Japan, Korea, China, and the Yugyu Kingdom as goods. It circulated as raw materials, as techniques, as motifs and visual languages, and even as artisans who relocated to different, to different polities. And all of this fueled a very lively cross-regional exchange that continued almost uninterrupted even during times of relative isolationism. And so the exhibition traces the nature of these exchanges in lacquer as trade, tribute, and treasure. And those continuously emerge through the connections between the objects on view. So let us begin with trade. The Silk Road of the Sea refers to the maritime trade routes that blanketed the waterways of East and Southeast Asia. Lacquer was traded both as goods and as raw materials flowing freely throughout the region. Now, few works in the exhibition encapsulate more adequately, I would say, the notion of cross-regionality than this very mysterious chest from deep in Lakma storage. The front facade draws from a quintessentially Chinese subject, maidens in a garden before a painted screen. The ladies are engaged in needlework. One is shown with her shears, another holds up a needle. The painted screen also bears a garden scene. So this painting within a painting allows the artist to really flaunt his command of the material. Notice the expertly blurring of boundaries. The contours of the garden rock are continued seamlessly into the screen, now transforming into the main landmass. <clears throat> Moss dots are reimagined as shrubbery. Miniature figures of literati are gazing in the same direction as the maidens, as if, as if taking their cue. The weeping willow's foliage is rendered in infinitesimal mother of pearl inlays. What mastery of this established Chinese subject. But this is not a Chinese work. 
How do we know that? What is our first clue? Well, their hairdo is certainly not Chinese. They have these tightly fitted bonnets over two large hair buns. But this wouldn't be the first thing to scream out, nor would it be the Japanese-inspired textile. Notice the feet. What can we tell about the feet? These are not bound feet. Hmm, how scandalous. So from the Song Dynasty and well into the Republican era, ladies of fine birth would invariably be sporting tiny bound feet. Now this shoe size would not do. The other facades now depart altogether from Chinese aesthetics, suddenly drawing from the visual vocabulary of Korean mother of pearl, Nae Jong Chilgi. We see here almost geometric designs in the leaves. We see auspicious cranes, very popular in Korean lacquer. And those are arranged in this near mathematical cadence. Now, when we consider this against a 19th century elongated Korean chest, also in view in the exhibition with its prancing deer, cranes in mid-flight, these thickets of bamboo and stylized clouds, we can immediately identify this as a shared visual vocabulary. The staccato lines, the fragmented forms so unique to Korean mother of pearl are evident in the segmented inlaid line framing the composition of both pieces. But again, this is not Korean either. Neither is it Japanese, despite the patterns on the robes. This lacquered chest was actually made in the Ryukyu Islands, now Okinawa. Now here we meet a key player. The Ryukyu Kingdom was a sovereign polity um, up until its annexation, ultimate annexation in 1872 to Japan. The archipelago was quite scarce in natural resources with the exception of um, sulfur, mother of pearl and lacquers. And this um, quite likely spurred the inhabitants to master seafaring and trade. The UQ traders were seasoned intermediaries between China, Japan, and Korea, and they also monopolized the South Southeast Asian seas, frequenting Siam, Malacca, um, Java, Palembang, and so forth. Now, in fact, it wasn't only lacquer that spurred trade, but also trade that spurred lacquer. In 1393, a community of um, Chinese craftsmen, shipbuilders significantly, relocated to Okinawa by decree of the Ming Emperor. They were meant to transmit shipbuilding techniques. But lacquer was a central component of that process. And this likely actually helped boost the development of lacquer art in the, in the Ryukyu Islands. So lacquer makers from China, as well as from Korea, established communities in the Niukyu Island starting um, around the late 14th century. They absorbed local techniques and they likewise influenced and helped reshape the trajectory of Niukyuan lacquer art domestically. And so returning to this chest, this amalgam is not without its shortcomings. The bottom frame of the screen, for example, is discontinued in, a, in an apparent oversight. It rests on the floor without any brackets or support. And my favorite yet, notice where the maiden facing us is situated. She is awkwardly lodged into the table. So what happens here? The Yukyu Kingdom was a floor-sitting culture like Japan and unlike China, which had high tables and chairs from um, the 10th century on. So we can assume that the maidens were first arranged within the composition and that this tall table came as a, as a haste afterthought. But regardless of some compositional mishaps, the work beautifully marries these disparate motifs, techniques, and subject matters. It embodies, it embodies an emergence of new styles, both locally 
and abroad. Now, just a few cases to the right, we come across another enigma. In Lo, the portable multi-compartment cases came to be um, quite popular in the Edo period. And at this point, they're practically synonymous with Japan. So it's very small wonder that for decades, this little mystery here was cataloged as Japanese in origin. But by now, I hope we might be approaching its identification with a modicum of caution. We can then suddenly note the regularly spaced fragments of gold leaf, the mosaic of mother of pearl separated into these groupings and groupings of color that are achieved not just by selecting parts of the abalone shell that skew more green or skew more purple, but here, they are enhanced by adding pigment to the underside. Underside of shells of sheets that are so thin that they, that they had to be boiled first. And then we come to look at the dragon. The dragon's bristling mane, its animated countenance, its features dispel any lasting doubt, revealing it to be Diukyun. And so here we might remark an affinity between this dragon and another we've seen before. And with this, we turn to the second mode of lacquer's trans transmigration. Tribute. Diplomatic relations in pre-modern East and Southeast Asia often took form in tribute delegations. Envoys bearing gifts were instrumental in establishing economic and political ties. So I do want us to, um, I want to caution us from conflating that idea of um, gift bearing envoys with what we think of today as China's tribute system. Granted, China's clout did um, ensure very regular delegations from neighboring polities. But diplomatic tributes gifts were presented from all directions, from China to the UQ, from Korea to China, from China to Japan and so forth. So it was really more of an exchange rather than um, simply the presentation of gifts that was prevalent throughout the region, throughout the realm. And lacquerware was quite the favorite form of tribute. So we return to our dragon here. We find it one of a pair on an exquisite and gargantuan tray shown here, completely dwarfing the tidal wall. It was produced in the royal workshops of the Ryukyu kingdom. It is identical in make to a set of 10 that were produced as a tribute gift to the Kangxi emperor of China in 1666 in the Qing dynasty. And this was detailed in records of the royal uh, DQ lacquer workshops. Now, in the 18th century, numerous sets, very similar in make, were produced explicitly for the presentation of tribute gifts. And similar examples are now held in collections in China and Japan. And Lakme is fortunate to have this um, piece as well. So we see here two writhing dragons with five claws, therefore for imperial use, chasing a flame, um, a flaming pearl, a Buddha symbol. And that pearl is surrounded by four of the eight auspicious um, Buddhist emblems encased in these cartouches that are separated by detailed diapering. Note how large the sheets of mother of pearl are. Imagine the size of the abalone shells that were required to produce something on this scale. Truly a show of power, of opulence, and skill. And against this exercise in scale comes the finesse. Hair-thin etched details appear throughout the piece the pock marks on the dragon's jaw, the fine scales, the subtle plume fringing the underbelly, the soft underbelly of the serpentine body on the bottom left. Lacquer, 
fit for an emperor. Such is also a much smaller scale example of a little decorated shell here. This was produced in a technique called flattened and polished out design. It's pingtuan in Chinese, heidatsu in Japanese, hyongmun in Korean, where thin sheets of gold or silver are cut to form, then are finely incised and finally applied to a lacquered surface. Lacquer is then applied over the entire piece, and the piece is then polished to reveal the design, hence the name. This <clears throat> small, very small box cover, this thing of beauty, is about 1300 years old. It is an, ex an astounding example of this technique. A parrot is shown holding a blossoming branch in its beak, and it's surrounded by flora and fauna. The now oxidized silver was inlaid into the work by lacquer that was applied to a coarse cloth, um, hemp fiber cloth often. And so this work's deterioration due to age actually grants us a very rare glimpse into the process with these various layers exposed. A similar technique is used to achieve a very similar in make um, delicate design on a shell appearing here on the left. But this time it was produced in Korea in the unified Silla period, so roughly the same time. The absolute mastery and uniformity of this technique across the entire region appearing in works in Japan, in China, and in Korea all point um, to the point where, where specialists are truly hard pressed to identify the country of origin, all speak to the, to the speak volumes to the widespread and constant flow of lacquer art. And finally, we come to the third mode by which lacquer shuttled through East Asia, treasure. Now, cross-pollination did not mean the erasure of identity. And despite an unbroken constant process of exchange of inspiration, of adaptation, lacquer's arts, lacquer arts of Korea, China, Japan, and the Ryukyu Kingdom have retained their stylistic idiosyncrasies, and those were treasured as a source of pride. They turn to the fifth direction. They look inwards. They find their center, and they treasure these regional singularities. Japanese maki-e, um, sprinkled pictures, are, of course, as many of you know, um, uh, flex of metals applied to designs in wet lacquer, forming these breathtakingly intricate images of truly lyrical beauty. The process, the technique of maki has reached new heights of artistic achievement, truly, truly transcending the realm of craft. maki has been treasured as an emblem of cultural identity. Now, this exquisite example here bears the signature of Igarashi Doho. Doho was a scion of a lineage of lacquer artists who served generations of rulers. Doho himself served the Maeda daimyo, who governed the Kaga prefecture, which is Ishikaga um, prefecture today. So, it is a writing box or suzini bako, which literally translates to ink stone box. It was used to hold um, writing paraphernalia like a water dropper, an ink stone, and other writing implements. Now, the subject depicted here is autumn flowers and grasses at dawn. So we see brimming over this 
very lowbrow thatched fence by a riverbank. These autumnal, different autumnal flora. We see these slender pampas, pampas grasses, suki, um, and this explosion of chrysanthemums kiku, in full bloom. Some of them in um, now darkened silver, some of them in various shades of gold. Now, since they were intended for a daimyo use, the lavish use of gold, as well as the chrysanthemums motif, which denote um, nobility and longevity, are therefore extremely apt. The autumnal flora indicates the season. The full moon marks the time of the month. And the silver bosses that appear throughout the, the piece, mimicking these morning dewdrops and are characteristic of Iganashi Doro's work hint at the time of day. Now, in addition to the, to the absolute opulence of the precious materials, the work also flaunts a multitude of techniques. Against a nashiji, nashiji ground are both raised and flat designs, takamakie and hiramakie. We see kirigane, cut sheets of gold arranged in, a, in particular patterns, um, giving volume and texture to cloud scrolls. We also see fundame or powdered gold applied to applied so densely that it sort of creates a unified, almost opaque surface. It is seen here on the sandy shawl. Now, almost imperceptibly minute inlays also give form to moss dots on rockery protruding from the river. And the ripples in the water are likely applied, achieved with a technique called tsukegaki, where thin raised lines of wet lacquer are applied um, over the finished work and then sprinkled again with powdered gold, creating this multidimensionality. Truly a tour de force. But how about this Eno? Is this pocket-sized trinket not also worthy of similar, similar praise? Shibata Zeshin, the 19th century lacquer superstar, broke into international consciousness already in his own lifetime. He proves in this work that the art of makia lacquer does not hinge on precious metals. Now he retains this virtuosity of makie while also stripping it from the costly use of gold. So our friend here is a lacquer artisan holding a hake brush in one hand and a polishing cloth in another. He is just beginning to apply lacquer to a wooden box. These two um, Bunny-shaped silhouettes on the left are lacquered hats. Don't know, perhaps he already finished working on those, or perhaps they are the next um, in his production line. Now, Zeshin's virtuosity here shines through in his stripping of Makie from the burden of costly or banned materials. He hones the pure essence of the technique. So we similarly have here, takamakie, hiramakie, inlays of mother of pearl, kirigane, we even see tsukegaki, and so on. All while um, quite the spare use of gold, especially when considered against doho's suribako. So there are many, um, urban legends about how Zeshin achieved these effects exactly. Um, how he used, for example, a rat's tooth to mimic wood grain. And here, perhaps we might consider this box and in relation to that, to that story. 
or how he makes different concoctions into his lacquer recipes to enhance the material's elasticity. Now, this allowed him to use it on paper, just like ink and color. So before us here is a very small painting rendered on paper done entirely with lacquer. It is potentially one of my favorite pieces, um, favorite paintings of um, Zeshin that I have had a chance to see. And was also um, one of the paintings. And I've also um, encountered Zeshin, uh, Zeshin's paintings first when I went to visit um, Ms. Avant when um, Hollis and I went. So the translucency of the line in the, in the tendrils looping around the thin shoot, the fluctuation of the, the thickness of the line, the gradation in hue from the thick application of the veins to the very light washes of the gourd in the background. These are all um, expected of the ink brush. We see the volume, we see the depth, we see the five colors of ink, but here, these are all achieved with lacquer alone. Now the painting is mounted as a hanging scroll. It was handled, rolled and unrolled. It was displayed and then stowed away. But it remains in remarkable state of conservation. There are no brittles, no flaking. Zeshin's paintings endure. How did we do it? How did he do it? We don't know. Zeshin's, um, Zeshin took many of these secret recipes and techniques with him to his grave. But the secret treasure, the, this, um, these treasure, treasured secrets, which, um, which he has taken to his grave with him, are beginning now to unfold for us with the advent of technology, with developments in research. And so, moving through the exhibition, there is no one correct route, just as there is no one single course of development of lacquer art in the region. As you circumnavigate these islands and islands of connections, which ricochet in all five directions. Each lacquer producing center emerges as a center in its own right. And as you set out tracing these multi-directional journeys through space and time, first, go to the center of the gallery, the fifth direction. Thank you. The exhibition the Five Directions opens uh, opened December 18th, 2022, just a month ago, and is now on view at the Resnick Pavilion at LACMA. And it will run until April 16, 2023. Leonor, thank you so much. We, we have a, a few minutes before Hollis is going to join us. So I do see that there's already um, one, one question. Um, and that is, the person wanted to find out, were, do we know for sure that lacquer artists were always men? Were there, were there families of lacquer artists? Would, would women participate? That is a wonderful question. There are contemporary lacquer artists who are, who are families who um, are both men and women. The examples, the names that we've come across are primarily men. Um, that might be partly due to the uh, tasking qualities of the of um, lacquer making, the, the fact that it was very um, um, toxic. So it was uh, it was creating a quite the strong um, 
skin reactions. It was not a very healthy mode of living. And I think that might have been part of it. Could you talk to us a bit about how you came to make this exhibition at LACMA? What was the impetus? So the show started as a glimmer of an idea back in 2018 when um, our department with um, uh, my then director um, of the department, uh, Dr. Stephen Little, were asked to put together an exhibition on the collection of Chinese lacquers. There is a wonderful collection of Chinese lacquers at LACMA, um, primarily owing um, to um, uh, Li Yuquan, um, the collector who is now passed. And his family uh, gifted many of the many works to the collection. So it was a very it was a very tight and beautiful collection to to do something with. And as I began researching the subject, I realized that you can't really tell a comprehensive, a complete story without bringing in Japanese and Korean and Ryukyuan lacquer. Now, LACMA also has a very strong collection of Ryukyu lacquers, which is quite rare outside of um, outside of Okinawa, outside of Japan, um, with the exception of the collection in um, Hawaii. And so it was um, it was really tracing these connections that made me realize that this would be um, a wonderful opportunity to rethink the narratives that we've um, up to this point um, have been sort of given about the development of lacquer art. Is there is there a catalog that accompanies the exhibition or? No, unfortunately. I was very glad that my microphone was muted because in several of the slides, when you would show an object, I would gasp. But I think the technique, especially when you mention the, the age of these pieces and the fact that they're in such good condition, who, who brought them to the attention of the museum? Or was the, was the museum always actively collecting lacquer or? Yes, so the previous, um, the curator emeritus, um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Koyama, George Koyama, was a specialist of lacquer, and he um, very early on made um, quite quite the strong uh, selection of pieces. And so, quietly, the museum aggregated um, a substantial a substantial number of works. And is that true for the Ryukyuan pieces as well, or? Yes. So many of the many of the Yukian pieces are also um, also came through um, Li Yukuan. We have a we have a comment from one of Jackie's friends who who wants you to know that the the, the graphics and the lacquer pieces in this exhibition are so breathtaking. Your commentary gives them life, Aynor. Jacqueline Avond introduced me to lacquer, and it has enriched my life immensely. Um, and I wanted to mention also to people who are listening that um, our publication Impressions in the part two of volume 43, there are tributes to Jacqueline Avant. So I know that JASA members can refer to last year's publication. And for those people who are not JASA members, you can certainly go online and order it uh, through, our, through our, our website. Did you ever have a chance to um, interact with Jackie as she looked at pieces and selected pieces? So and then the first time I met Jackie was when Hollis took me there to see to see her collection. And it was um, it was such a memorable uh, day. We went there and she she spread this large um, number of works in rooms and rooms of, in her in her house. And one particular piece that really resonated with me, as I mentioned, which is also why I concluded the talk with, with uh, Zexin, is a painting by him using lacquer. And so at the time we were hoping to, we were planning on um, borrowing some of the works from her collection and then the unthinkable happened. How do you see contemporary lacquer? Do you, do you see it going in different directions? I think that people are interested in, I mean, if we look at Tanaka Nobuyuki's work, 
it's certainly really, really different from these, these pieces. There are um, different directions that contemporary lacquer artists take. Some, um, like Tanaka Nobuyuki, for example, is using traditional techniques and materials, but he's completely um, reinventing the aesthetics of lacquer. And it's, um, it's abstracted. It's almost um, supra mundane, right? And some artists are use are inventing new techniques and um, finding finding completely new techniques to to bring a very similar uh, traditional aesthetic. There, it, it's a it's a very it's a very um, interesting subject that was explored in the exhibition Hard Bodies that um, Andreas Marx has curated at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Exactly. If I remember, I remember that show well. Well, I'm very pleased that Hollis is here. So um, we are going to turn the microphone over to her. Hollis, welcome. There she is. Hi there. I just uh, wanted to say a few words about, about Jackie Avant specifically, because she was not just a patron, but a friend of mine. Um, and so thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to do this. And let me know if my hair is on fire or anything, because I'm not looking at the screen correctly. Anyway. Um, thank you, Anor, once again for putting this show together. It's fantastic. I love it. And the docents were are thrilled beyond belief to be able to see East Asian art all together. Um, and then your talk, of course, was fantastic. Uh, but I'm going to talk about Jackie, who you see here in a picture with Eric Thompson. Jacqueline Avant had an amazing life and one facet that added so much to her quality of life was her fascination for Japanese art and aesthetics. In college, she read the tale of Genji, thus beginning her slow fall in love with the poetic sensibilities and subtleties of Japanese art. She incorporated the elegance of Japanese aesthetics deeply into her world, surrounding herself with her personal passion, as you can see in this image. Jackie collected Japanese lacquer, the central impetus for today's talk, but also Japanese painting, ranging from Shinto icons and courtly themes to genre scenes and nature studies. Jackie's sly sense of humor came out in some of the works that she collected, including a hilarious painting of seven otafuku from the Meiji era and a lacquer tray that I used to fawn over showing a tanuki trying his very best to look distinguished. Jackie was endlessly generous, sharing her collections with folks who wanted to see them, including JASA members and the public in the Dallas Metroplex through an exhibition I curated for the Crow Museum of Asian Art, sharing her wealth with educational institutions, notably Howard University, museums, including LACMA, the Huntington, and Scripps, and with charitable foundations. I can speak today mostly of pieces that she helped fund for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Next, please, Helen. A no robe that was the first such costume to enter LACMA's collection at the request of Sharon Takeda. A print with a similar aesthetic of intertwining strands pigmented with lacquer through Alison Tolman. A stunning women's kimono with interlacing mountains, which is a star of our Japanese mid-century collection. Instead of Zuan by Furuya Korin, showing the bleeding edge of Kyoto design at the turn of the last century and a gorgeous incense container by contemporary artist Yamamura Shinya, which reminds me of the lullaby of wink and blink and a nod. 
and two works at the request of Robert Singer, an ink painting of a hawk on a grape on grapevines by Tendu Dojin, and an array of kakiemon plates. Note how the hawk cannot take his eyes off the plate, and neither can I. <laughs> Jackie was a genteel person, often ending a sentence with, well, you know, rather than divulging too much about anyone or anything. Her tone when saying, well, you know, created the appropriate impression of either scandal or resignation. About as sassy as she got in public was to say, oh, oh my Lord, which was a great lesson to people like me who tend to speak without a proper filter. I will always hear Jackie's voice in my head and I will feel her presence in my heart as someone who shared with us the rapture for the depth and transfixing qualities of Japanese art. Thank you very much. Hollis, thank you so much. That, that really, that's, that's a lovely, a, a lovely tribute. I, I know that you knew her, you knew her well and this has been such a special evening. I'd like to leave everybody with um, a comment from her daughter who just, who just wrote us to say that she is so profoundly grateful for this talk and tribute to my mother. I know she's smiling down from the heavens and is also very grateful to all of you for taking the time to honor her spirit with much gratitude. Well, well thank you. And I, I, learned, I learned a lot about Jackie and I learned a lot about Lacquer as well. And I would like to remind our JASA members that the program committee labors on tirelessly. Our next program will be February 7th. It's a book talk by Ramona Handel Bayema, Art Across Borders, about Japanese artists coming to the United States at the beginning of the 20th century and their artistic practices. And in the meantime, because Aynor Cervone, as I said, is tireless. She has also organized a symposium which will take place at the Denver Art Museum on February 25th. It is the first free Denver symposium, the first free symposium that the Denver Art Museum has ever organized. And it is hybrid. So you can either register in person and in Zoom. And even before that symposium, JASA is organizing a trip to Houston to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to look at Zenga paintings from the Gitter Yellen collection. And Professor Yukio Lippet will be delivering a talk at that time. That's the weekend of February 18th and 19th. Thank you all very, very much. And I wish you all a pleasant and wonderful beginning of the year. And I will hope to see you on screen soon. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Good night.